He suddenly turns to night as a spectacular solar eclipse mesmerizes millions from coast to coast. Disaster at sea, another crash involving a U.S. Navy destroyer in the Pacific. Ten American sailors missing. War plan. President Trump addresses the nation on America's mission in Afghanistan. Are more troops headed into harm's way? Courthouse ambush. A gunman opens fire on a judge. The judge firing back and survives. Tonight, the suspect's connection to a case that made national headlines. And under pressure, doctors sound the alarm about a silent condition hitting a growing number of kids. Nightly News begins right now. World Headquarters in New York. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for being with us. Things were looking up all across America today as the United States found itself in a celestial sweet spot, a front row seat for a total solar eclipse that swept a shadow from Oregon to South Carolina in just 90 minutes. There were cheers and some tears of joy as day turned to twilight in its direct path and eclipse pilgrims who traveled from far and wide to experience the moment from just the right places, even in the sky aboard a special eclipse flight, were rewarded for their efforts. Our team was on hand to witness it all. Tom Costello starts our coverage from South Carolina. Hi, Tom. Hi, Lester. What a day. Millions of people from west coast to east mesmerized by the celestial event. And you know, the last time we had a total eclipse move across the country was 99 years ago. As one former astronaut said today, these are the days, these are the events when you realize how small we all are in space and time. It didn't matter where you were for the total eclipse. The reactions seemed universal. Awestruck, elation, magical, communal, even tearful. What a great memory it is. Oh my gosh. First, the countdown, then the showstopper. Oh my God. <laughs> the crowds were enormous from the Oregon coast to Casper, Wyoming. I've seen like a moon, the sun. Carbondale, Illinois to Washington, D.C., where the president first looked at the sun without eclipse glasses before an aide urged him to put them on. From Tennessee to South Carolina. It's just been incredible just to watch it. It's just like, oh my gosh. Where thousands gathered at the USS Yorktown in Charleston Harbor, hoping, even praying, that the day's clouds would part. Then, at the last possible moment, it happened. This is a spectacular show. You couldn't ask for better. We're getting to see the, the, the moon and its interaction with the sun quite clearly, despite a little cloud cover. It was just the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in my life. Did it live up to expectation? Absolutely. Amazing. For the millions of people in 14 states who looked up, that brief moment of totality will last a lifetime. Seeing totality, even if it was only for a few seconds, it. made it worthwhile. Very happy. And, and you know, Back in Charleston, where Georgia Cub Scout Pack 650 had spread out on the deck of the Yorktown, taking it all in, eight-year-old Ryan Elwood made sure to bring his stuffed dog Patrick along. Because he likes to make me fall asleep when it's dark, and I like when I get to fall asleep, and, and I just like it. It was, quite simply, one of life's special moments you just had to share with someone you love. Tom Costello, NBC News, Charleston. I'm Miguel Almaguer in Madras, Oregon, where the moment the nation had been waiting for... Oh, there's a diamond ring! There's the ring! ...proved surreal. A hundred thousand people flooded the fields of this small farm town to experience the extraordinary. Under perfectly clear skies, Madras became one of the first cities to fall beneath the blanket of darkness, an epic view. You no longer need these safety glasses. People are cheering. We have been told it is a spiritual moment, a hair-raising moment. It is certainly that. The Barron family drove six hours from Seattle. My heart kind of started pounding and felt like it was stopped and I felt chilled. Spectators came from around the globe. History on the horizon. All thumbs up. Oh, what it cracked up to be. You got to see one. It's been said no other event in nature can eclipse this. 
With this ring? With this ring. Under the stars and planets, Michael and Julie Caston were married today. You may kiss your bride. Exchanging vows during the so-called diamond ring. The first few seconds after totality. Here come diamond ring. Diamond ring. A moment they will never forget. And one millions of others. This is so beautiful. Will treasure forever. 12 million people lived in the path of the total eclipse. 7 million more, including many of the people out here, worked their way into it. As Tom mentioned, it's been nearly 100 years since an eclipse like this, and it'll be another 38 until we get something similar here in the U.S. Lester? Quite a day. Miguel Almaguer for us tonight. Thank you. We turn now to another major story, the urgent search for 10 American sailors missing at sea after the USS John McCain collided with a massive oil tanker off Singapore last night. And new tonight, the Navy has now ordered an investigation looking into the performance of its entire Pacific fleet as it pauses operations worldwide. NBC's Janice Mackie Freyer is in Singapore with more. Tonight, once again, a frantic search at sea for missing U.S. sailors. Ten unaccounted for after the USS John S. McCain was struck by a tanker the destroyer gashed, dented, and listing. Navy officials now ordering a temporary halt to their entire operations to figure out why two incredibly sophisticated Navy ships have collided with other vessels in just two months. The Chief of Naval Operations broader inquiry uh, will look at all related accidents, uh, incidents at sea. It happened in the darkness, 5.24 a.m. local time, the USS McCain passing east of the busy Strait of Malacca, on its way to Singapore, colliding violently with a larger 600-foot oil and chemical tanker. The USS McCain taking on water, including flooding inside the rooms where crew members sleep. The crash bears haunting similarities to another collision involving another destroyer from the 7th Fleet. In June, the USS Fitzgerald hitting a cargo ship off the coast of Japan. Seven sailors killed, the ship flooded. The commander who was in his cabin found seriously injured, hanging from the side of the ship. He was relieved of duty. With two other incidents this year, there are urgent questions tonight about readiness and training. This is probably a systemic problem of some kind. The Navy has to conduct a serious period of soul searching here to understand what is going so terribly wrong with our ships at sea. This is all happening at a critical time. The crash takes a second U.S. guided missile destroyer out of action with tension over North Korea at a high. The primary focus for now here, of course, is the search for those 10 sailors who are still missing. Lester? All right, Janice Mackey Freyer in Singapore, thank you. Tonight, President Trump will address the nation in prime time, unveiling what the White House is calling the path forward in Afghanistan. President, who previously advocated for an immediate withdrawal while Barack Obama was president, may be about to send thousands more American troops to Afghanistan, where U.S. forces have now been for 16 years. We have it all covered, starting with NBC's Kristen Welker. Kristen. Lester, this is President Trump's first major primetime policy address, and it comes as polls show his approval rating is sagging. With this announcement tonight, Mr. Trump becomes the third president to take on the war in Afghanistan, a conflict he now owns. With the Taliban and terror groups gaining ground in Afghanistan, Defense Department officials tell NBC News the president may not get specific about troop levels. But they say as many as 4,000 could be sent, with a strong presence from the CIA and special forces, adding to the 8,400 who are already there. If you look at a map of Afghanistan, the Taliban has made enormous gains in the last couple of years. I think the answer is we want to be invested in Afghanistan. I mean, to kind of put it bluntly so that what happens in Afghanistan stays in Afghanistan. The president gave his defense secretary, James Mattis, the authority to determine the number of U.S. forces needed. But Mr. Trump made the final decision. The process was rigorous. It all marks a major shift for a president who campaigned as a non-interventionist. The people opposing us are the same people who we've, and think of this, who've wasted six trillion dollars on wars in the Middle East. 
and even before the campaign, tweeting in 2013, do not allow our very stupid leaders to sign a deal that keeps us in Afghanistan through 2024 with all costs by USA. Make America great. Now, President Trump grappling with many of the same issues in Afghanistan that ensnared his predecessors. That's in some ways eerily similar to Vietnam is uh, you can't get out. If you get out, the situation gets worse. And that's the challenge facing Mr. Trump as well as his predecessors. A war that stretched nearly two decades and claimed more than 2,000 American lives. Kristen Welker, NBC News, the White House. I'm Richard Engel. Just after 9-11, the U.S. went to war in Afghanistan. The Taliban there was sheltering Osama bin Laden. Within months, the Taliban was defeated and al-Qaeda driven out. Sixteen years later, the Taliban is resurgent and the Afghan government only controls about half the country. And there's a new player, too, ISIS. It doesn't control much land. But it's aggressive, and unlike the Taliban, which wants to govern again, ISIS has shown no concern for killing civilians. Like most of the more than 100 people killed by a truck bomb in Kabul's diplomatic quarter last May, or the patients and staff at a Kabul hospital who hid on windowsills as ISIS gunmen went on a room-to-room -room killing spree. Back in 2009, President Obama tried a surge of 33,000 troops. In April, the U.S. military dropped the 21,000-pound so-called mother of all bombs against an ISIS tunnel complex. But little changed. I don't think we're going to get a military victory in Afghanistan. I think what you might see is the opposition would simply fade away. The Taliban would disappear. They would blend back into the population. Adding more troops, analysts say, may help prevent state collapse in Afghanistan. But it's unlikely to significantly alter the course of America's longest war, and one that's long been an afterthought. Richard Engel, NBC News. President Trump addresses the nation on Afghanistan tonight at 9 Eastern Time, 6 Pacific. We'll have live coverage here on NBC. Overseas today, authorities in Spain say they shot and killed the man suspected of driving the van in that deadly terror attack in Barcelona, claimed by ISIS. The tip apparently came from people who spotted him at a train station. Police say they now believe the cell behind the attack has been broken. Eight suspected members killed and four now in custody. Now to a warning from the director of the U.S. Secret Service who says his agency's resources are pushed so far to the limit it is running into trouble paying agents as they carry out their duty to protect President Trump's large and often mobile family. Though it's a problem, he says, that has been building long before now. NBC's Peter Alexander explains. They are the first line of defense with no room for error. But the Secret Service now says by year's end, roughly 1,100 agents already putting in brutally long hours will not be getting paid for that extra work. They're being stretched thin in part by President Trump's frequent travel, spending nearly every weekend since his inauguration at his properties in Florida, New Jersey, and Virginia. Agents are now protecting 42 people, including 18 Trump family members with their jet-setting lifestyle, business, and pleasure. Tiffany Trump lounging on a yacht in Italy, Eric Trump's Uruguay trip, costing Americans nearly $100,000 for agents' hotel rooms alone. The Secret Service director texts Alice tonight saying it's an ongoing issue that cannot be attributed to the current administration's protection requirements alone. Earlier telling USA Today, the president has a large family and our responsibilities required in law. I can't change that. I have no flexibility. You need to have fresh, well-trained uh, agents available you know, for protection. It's going to take a toll in terms of morale on the agents. By law, those agents can't make more than $160,000 in salary and overtime. The agency is now working with Congress on a financial fix to better support the president's elite protective force. Peter Alexander, NBC News, the White House. Still ahead tonight, the judge ambushed on the way to his courthouse. The surprising connection between a suspected shooter and an infamous case that made headlines across the country. Also a new warning about the alarming rise in high blood pressure among a group you may not expect, American children. Stay with us. Steve was born to move. Over the course of nine days, he walks 26.2 miles. That's a marathon because he chooses to walk whenever he can. And he does it with support from Dr. Scholz. Oh, 
Only Dr. Scholl's has massaging gel insoles that provide all-day comfort to keep him feeling more...